what does it really mean to build a customer culture? I'd like to introduce today's speakers. We um, have Claire Burge, CEO of This Is Productivity, here with us today. She actually was a keynote at Customer Success Summit at the end of February and one of, a, one of our highest ranked um, and rated speakers after the event. Um, she is a dynamic speaker that's going to bring lots of energy and a lot of insight into this topic of customer culture. And she is joined by Omer Gottlieb, co-founder of Tatango. He um, has co-founded Tatango back in 2010 and has years of experience working in the customer success and customer centricity space. So I'd like to go ahead and welcome Claire to um, take it away and maybe share a little bit more about yourself and today's topic. Hi everybody, it's really good to be here with all of you guys today. Thank you for this opportunity. And I'm particularly excited to have this conversation today just to give everybody a little bit of context in terms of you know how this conversation came about. Over the period of the Customer Success Summit, what happened was we basically realized that one of the cohesive themes that emerged out of Customer Success Summit earlier this year was the fact that the culture inside a company is absolutely critical. And a lot of the conversations that happened was everybody in the room agreed that, yes, customer centricity is absolutely important and it's absolutely critical, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of barriers inside the larger organization. And so, you know, as we did a post-review of Customer Success Summit and we chatted about it, we said, why don't we open this up? Why don't we actually have a conversation about this amongst people who are customer success specialists? And, and I think that's what this, this webinar is, is for today. And I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with Ovo because there's just so much to explore. And I'm particularly excited about the polls that we're going to have um, where we want your guys' participation in this so that we can really just lay a foundation and, and explore this topic, you know, in terms of what does it mean to really, really change an organization and bring them to a place of thinking about the customer as an integral part of the culture? Omar, what are your thoughts on that? Claire, thanks for, uh, for joining us. It's exciting to uh, be speaking with you today. So basically, the main theme about it is that if you're in a subscription business, uh, your success actually equals to uh, your customer success. And it's important to your stakeholders. It's important to employees. Uh, it's important to your customers, of course. And what I want to do in uh, the following slide is just provide some few proof points. Uh, based on, on uh, your score, it seems like everybody's bought in, or most of the people here are bought into the idea. So just a, a basic few uh, uh, proof points about this. Uh, the first one, for example, is uh, from Gardner that actually shows how important retaining customers uh, is for, uh, for your growth engine. Uh, so basically, as much as you actually improve customer uh, retention, it can lead to a lot of profit profitability into that. Uh, the second is a nice quote with, uh, from Forbes that actually speaks that in, in order for you to succeed in a subscription business, you must, as a business, serve your customers, you understand the needs, and keep them happy all the time. I think one of the questions I'd like to uh, speak about in this webinar is, you know, around the world business and whether is that your entire business, your entire company, or just a dedicated customer success team that actually uh, fights with everybody or fights all the other fires and, and try to make your customer successful. So we'll speak about it in a few minutes. That one from Forbes. Uh, the next one is from... Uh, um, the founder of Whole Foods Market, of, or if I can say, uh, you know, Amazon uh, right now, that speaks about, you know, culture. And he says that basically, you know, while the management job is to take care of employees, employees' job is to take care of customers, and happy customers take care of the share shareholders, think about it. It's about, it is about culture. It's about how you make your customers successful, how you make your employees successful. And I think this is something that, uh, Claire will speak in, in, in a few minutes about. Um, another proof point comes from uh, um, Forrester, where we actually can see that they took uh, companies that are leaders in customer experience, and you can see that the total return on, on revenue is actually much higher than the standard, standard and poor 500 index. 
So definitely customer success uh, impacts uh, shareholder uh, value. And the last proof point, which uh, is something that I really like, I don't know if uh, you guys all read Jeff Bezos' letter to the, his shareholders. It was something I think about a month ago. Basically, he speaks about customer obsession and customer culture and how to align your business around your customers. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details here, but it's about resisting proxy and saying, you know, don't do strict processes like this, embracing external trends and, and actually enable, enabling the employees to take high velocity uh, decision on that. So I think one of the things we'll do is actually speak about that. But I think it's time to actually, Christine, if we can try another poll uh, that tries to understand who's leading the customer success initiative in your company. So, Christine, can you launch the poll? Hoping this one will be easier. Who leads the initiative for customer centricity at your company? All right, it looks like it's working this time, Omer. Um, and yeah. Claire, the answers, can you see the answers on the right, Claire? Yes, yeah. yeah. and see them coming up, so that's fantastic. Great. Okay. I've also just seen that um, Eric Michelson has actually asked a question as well. And Eric, I'm really happy that you raised that because that's exactly why we've just done this poll and that's exactly the topic that I'm going to talk about. So, Christine, if you can flip to the relevant slide, yeah, or I actually can pull it up. That's not a problem at all. So. Claire, just a remark. I'm, I'm not hmm. sure everybody can see those questions, so if you want to repeat what Eric has asked, you can feel free to do okay. so. that. What Eric has asked in the stream, which is re very relevant to this, is from the perspective of a CCO, how to change a corporate culture that pays lip service to an employee culture but daily acts upon customer centricity. So, and I think this is one of the key points. You know, going back to the customer success summit, people said, yes, we as a group of people, we as customer success leaders are totally bought into this, but getting that, you know, spreading out into the rest of the organization is what's so challenging. And um, you know, based on the poll here, you can very definitely see that because it's still very much the top executive level of management and, you know, the customer success department that is really leading this cultural change. But in terms of that permeating across the rest of the company, we're not quite seeing that. So, Christine, if you want to flip up there onto slide 11 for us, one of the key things that, that we as a company have you know, we always joke about this when we're working with our clients and when we're working with customer success teams is that we come from an era where everything is this very, very strict process. You go from A to B, from B to you progress to X, and from there you go up there. And, you know, everything is seen as this linear process. But the reality of it when it comes to working with customers is that it's actually a very, very big mess. And it's organic and it changes and it's very chaotic and it's that whole area and reality inside companies nowadays that, that people are tending to resist and going hang on a minute this doesn't feel comfortable I don't know how to move out of that organic process inside the company and move towards a place of embracing each um, client as they come along embracing you know each situation as it arises and so you know, how do you actually move along? How do you bring the organization to that place where they can embrace the chaos and they can move away from that linear process of thinking? And ultimately, it is going back to Omer's slide where Jeff Bezos wrote that, that letter to his employees is that it's actually starting to see the customer as an individual and starting to understand each case as an individual case. And this is where... Customer success stands at a very, very interesting junction because if you look at every single one of the, the business functions inside companies nowadays, so when I say business functions, I'm talking about things like HR, I'm talking about legal, I'm talking about sales. So if you think about all the different areas in a business that make a business function, where the world of technology is taking those different business functions is very, very much into automation. And yet, if you look at customer experience and if you look at what needs to be done to truly, truly embrace individuality in customer service and truly move towards customer centricity, it almost seems at first as if it's going in the opposite direction of automation. And yet the actual initiatives in terms of reaching out to customers and that type of thing on the ground require a lot of automation. And so the juncture and the biggest hurdle, in my opinion, that we're seeing inside organizations that needs to be overcome is 
how do you blend automated customer service with very real high touch? This needs to feel like an experience where this customer is valued, where this customer feels embraced, and where I don't feel as if I'm being pushed into like a cookie cutter box. That's essentially one of the biggest challenges. And that is why there is this incredible resistance because HR, for example, and the whole people environment inside a company on many degrees lends itself very well to automation. Exactly the same thing in sales. It's an environment that lends itself very well to automation. But now what we need to start really, really considering is how do we bring that automation in but blend it in with the people and the experience components of that to make it feel like an individualized experience. And the rest of the webinar that we're going to talk about is we're going to delve into that, is that beautiful relationship between automation, systems, processes, technology, and then the skill sets that the customer-centric culture brings to that party. And so, Omar, I'm going to hand over to you, yeah, where you can actually start talking specifically about technology. And I'm very, very excited about what you're going to talk about. And we can then start looping it back and bringing everything together to talk about the people component in that. That's great, Claire, and, and thank you for that. And I think for me, this is uh, one of the most important slides in, in this slide in this webinar. And, and it basically says that customer success must become everyone's business. Now, most of you actually answer that uh, the person or the, the organization that leads customer centricity culture in your organization is the chief customer officer. And whether that's the right person or the CEO, that that's, you know, really depends on your organization, which is fine. But what we see here is that we have almost all the time a customer success team in front of the customer, but in the back, holding and helping the customer success team should be everybody in the company. I think that's the key. A lot of companies that I work with in the past are making the mistake and actually having the customer success team walk alone. If a customer is not successful, if a customer is churning, this is not the problem of the customer success team. And it's not only because of the customer success team. There could be many, many reasons because of that. And eventually, if you want to lead a customer-centric culture and company, you have to get everybody involved. It's about sales and marketing and, of course, engineering and product and professional services support. And even your billing and finance. I mean, everybody that has some kind of interaction with the customer should be supporting the customer success team should be leading this initiative about how to become a customer-centric uh, company. So think about it. Don't have your customer success team the only uh, organization that walks with the customer and in charge of it. See how we can actually make sure everybody is involved, everybody can help or needs to help to be a customer-centric company. Now let's speak about a technology that enables that. So to Tango actually launch what we call an enterprise to customer. For us, it's a technology that will enable those culture changes, those processes that Claire spoke about and will speak about. Let's drill down a little bit about what does it mean, enterprise to customer, and how do we actually uh, implement that? So there are three layers that uh, combine, I'm sorry, there are three layers that combine the E2C uh, platform uh, solution. It starts with the data in order to be a customer-centric company and to have a customer-centric culture, you need to have all the data. You need to connect all the dots of all the customer data. And those could be, of course, how they're using your product, their support tickets, their interaction with your team, and not just the customer success team, how they're paying, uh, attending of webinars, anything, any data that you have, that's one of the basic layers that we have, connecting uh, uh, all the dots there. On top of that, that's the customer engagement. How do you drive adoption, drive retention? These are tools that are mainly being used by the customer uh, success team. And the, the high level layer is the enterprise impact. How do you empower everyone in the company to participate in customer success? And I think the key is the combination of all those three. How do we take the right data about the customer, connect the dots, make it accessible to everybody in the company that will actually make sense. And to do that, uh, Tutango actually has uh, two products. One of them, if you're familiar with Tutango, is our traditional one, the Customer Success Center. It's mainly used by customer success teams. 
Uh, there's a lot of amazing feature and function that actually helps the customer success team to drive retention and adoption and manage the team and manage processes and manage customers. Uh, but again, since this webinar is not about this, if you do want more information about this, go to our website, you'll find a lot about it. On top of it, the Zoe. Zoe is the new product that we launched that actually will enable you to be a customer-centric company, again, based on the data that we collect from the Tutango DNA CX and based on the information in the Customer Success Center. Let's speak about Zoe. Zoe actually will enable you, will enable everybody in the company to participate in customer success. It, have, it has three different layers. One is access. Imagine that everybody in the company that has some kind of interaction about the customer or wants to know about the customer can actually ask information about specific customer or list of customers. I want my engineer to be asking who are our best customers? Who's not, in this, who's not using the feature that I've used? I want my CFO to ask, who's about to renew and not in good health? I want our marketing department to ask, who's actually a reference? I want the account executive, when I go to a meeting, ask, what is the status of this customer? So Zoe actually uh, make ac makes access to this kind of, kind of information very easily for anybody in the organization. The next thing is about participation. I've just spoke with uh, um, uh, a customer, and I want to share this kind of information with anybody, everybody in the company because of something great. I want everybody to know about it. I want everybody to know that there was something that's not so great. So Zoe enables me to take those kind of information and share it with anybody that I want in the company, either everybody or specific channel or specific people. And the last thing about it is impact. How do we as a customer success team and, and practitioners actually take action? How do we ask for help and make impact for a customer? For example, if I have a customer that is an upsell opportunity, but I can't do it alone, I need somebody from finance, I need somebody from sales, and maybe I need my VP of product to commit to some kind of a feature request, this is where I can take this information and create what we call an impact spec that will enable everybody that is related to that to take a step to volunteer, to enlist, and actually provide impact to this specific account. So again, Zoe enables everybody to participate in customer success by one, providing you access to the data, to participate in a discussion about customer, whether that's a good one or a bad one, and make impact. Um, Christine, I think we're ready for uh, uh, the next poll. Uh -huh. Before we jump into yeah. the poll, I think a very, very good question yeah. has just come through from Jessica, which is, how is this different from Salesforce? Do you want to handle that now? And I would also like to just give my opinion on that um, in my next section, but it would be great to hear that from your perspective. Sure. There's a lot of differences between uh, a solution like E2C and a CRM like uh, Salesforce. A CRM like Salesforce or any other CRM, uh, that is actually uh, intended to manage lead, manage sales processes. There's a lot of things that are missing there. One of it is the data. The kind of data that can be included within a CRM uh, is very, very limited, again, because it was designed to manage sales processes. Uh, in order for you to be a customer-centric company, you need to have a lot of different types of data about your customers, mainly how do they interact with your product? How do they consume your services? Do they see value? Was there a change there? And then combine it with other information that you have. So it starts with the data, and then it actually involves too many other things, like how do I uh, manage my team, and how do I uh, manage my processes? But basically, data and making all the information accessible to everybody in the company. If I want my engineering team to know about my customer, I don't want to provide them access to Salesforce. Nobody will want to have access to Salesforce. Uh, so it's a completely different uh, type of system and completely different type of solution. What's your take on that, Claire? Yeah, so my thoughts, and, and a few more questions are coming through. So, for example, Tim O'Donnell is asking, you know, what about Salesforce Marketing Cloud? Can you compare to that as well? And another question from Rob is coming in, what physical um, philosophical prerequisites exist for an organization in order for Zoe to be successful? And I think there's a linkage between all of these questions that I'd like to speak to. 
The difference in, and this comes back to the point that I was making about the different business departments in a company. The, the single difference for me that differentiates any form of customer technology like Zoe and the other ones that are starting to emerge on the market from the likes of your sales automation tools and all of those that fall into different business departments is the fact that unlike any of those others, you actually have the customer, which is the ultimate life and soul of the business at the center of those. So, for example, if you're looking at a, a sales automation suite of tools, and if you're looking at Salesforce as one of those in there, you're dealing with a customer, yes, and that is still the life and blood of it, but the difference is, is that you're not pulling every single interaction that touches that customer across the entire span of the organization. Whereas with a tool like Zoe, it lives at the center, and no matter which employee touches that customer, it all feeds into that. Whereas, for example, all of your sales tools are very, very focused on the actual sales function, which only handles the customer in one element of its life cycle or its journey with the company. I agree. I agree. And, I, and, and again, I think uh, I agree uh, completely. And I think it's about, you know, making sense of tons of information, making it visible to the right people, m making insights on this and making this information accessible and on top of that allowing people to participate and, and create impact. Uh, so I think those are the, some of the main differences between, uh, again, E2C and any other solution like a CRM. I think Robert is asking what philosophical prerequisites exist for organization in order for Zoe to be successful. Let's remove Zoe for a second, but I think the question is what do I need in an organization in order to be successful as a customer? Uh, centric company. And I'll give my two cents if you can add that's great. Again, for, for me, it's one initiative. You need to understand that this is where you want to be. And it's just not just saying that. It really meaning that means that because you will need to enlist people in the company uh, uh, to be customer centric. If you're ready for that, then you have to make sure that you have the right data about your customers and uh, collect the right data. You have to have the right processes. You have the right, you have the right tools. And I think it's mainly about culture. It's about working with people. I can give my example because I mean, we have uh, some more. But, for example, whenever I go and meet our engineering team, I want them to know what's happening with customers. They don't need to know all of our customers. But when we speak about something, we automatically see the data. We automatically speak about the customer X and the user Y and actually understand how they're using or not using the system, what the value that they're getting. Once you do that, even the engineer – Everybody gets an understanding about, okay, this is a real customer in front of me. And now amazing ideas actually pop up. They're, you know, inventing new things. They're much more uh, motivated. They're thinking about things that sometimes, you know, business people do not think about. And this is just one example. So, again, sharing the right information with the right people in the company, uh, I think that's uh, a prerequisite to actually being successful. Okay, which, which segues perfectly into the next section that I'm going to be dealing with, which is very specifically, how do you actually go about doing this? Like, how do you action this? What are the attitudes? What are the skill sets? What are the mindsets and the shifts and the changes that need to happen? And what I'm going to be sharing with you guys is not so much specifics as what I would like to share a framework, a thinking framework, because I believe if you can position a thinking framework, it basically acts as a model that you as a customer success professional are able to refer back to and you are then able to build specifics out of that. And what we do as a company, just to give everybody a little bit of context into, on the call so that you guys understand where we're coming from, is we actually work with SaaS companies and um, enterprise companies to build out their customer success function and to work alongside them to, to really enable this cultural shift to happen inside companies. And the thinking framework that we use inside business productivity to build that team and to build that framework inside a company consists out of three sections. And it's, it's a basic, very, very simple change management principle, which, you know, is found generically across a lot of different, you know, business thinking networks and, and literature out there. And that is that 
any form of change that needs to happen inside an organization needs to consist out of three very clear and distinct things. The first thing is it has to have a leadership component to it. The second thing is that whatever change is brought in cannot just be a spoken about process or a spoken about ideal concept. It has to actually be reinforced with a very specific piece of technology that backs up that behavior. And then the third piece of that triangle, if you will, is the actual individual. So the individual that you're trying to implement the change with needs to be enabled, enabled in order to bring that change together. So that simple triangle of leadership, technology, and process, and the individual enablement. If you can go into any form of work that you're doing as a customer success you know, specialist inside your organization and you think about the change that you need to bring about, if you can bring those three concepts or those three ingredients, if you will, to the party, you can almost be guaranteed that your initiative will be successful because it's basically been proven scientifically that when those three mechanisms are working inside an organization to bring about change, change does happen. And so, and what you can see very clearly in literature and research that has been done in organizations that are going through very big changes, whenever one of those pieces are missing in any shape or form, the change might happen, but it might take much, much longer, and it won't necessarily be sustainable. So what we're going for here is a framework which builds us up and basically takes us towards long-term sustainable change that sticks inside an organization. So for example, Dino, asked a question and he said, how can you go about and implement customer success in a service orientated IT firm? And so Dino, I'm not gonna answer this question very specifically for an IT firm, but what I'm gonna say is, is that whether you're actually building a customer success team or whether you are implementing a piece of software that's relating to that, or whether you're wanting to change the entire organization, to bring about this change towards customer-centric thinking, you need to bring all three of those ingredients. So you need to make sure that the executive leadership are actually bought into it. You need to make sure that there's technology and systems and processes that are driving that. And then you need to look at the people who actually need to drive that forward and go, how do we go and we enable them? And so one of the key things that I'm going to be looking at now specifically is, I want to touch out of that, that framework of three different nodes. I want to look specifically at the individual because if you think about it, the industry with the likes of Tatango in the industry, they've, they've brought the technology to us. They've, they've created a technology that we can embed into organizations and Zoe is taking that to the next level and allowing us to really, really embed that process into a company. Companies are really, really starting to take the leadership seriously and are trying to go, are saying to the market and to the world, yes, this is very, very serious. But where I believe the biggest lack is in this, in this whole triangle or within this framework is very much at the individual level. And there's a very specific reason why that's happening, and, and, and I'd like to talk to that. And the reason for that is because if you look at the skill sets that people are bringing into the workforce today and bringing into companies, it is starkly different to what is actually needed in order to create a customer-centric culture. And if you look at what generally happens with people when they come into organizations today, so even graduates and, and millennials coming into the workforce today, as well as existing people in the workforce today, our thinking is very robotic. Our thinking is very process orientated. So it doesn't matter what part of an organization you go into. Your job spec and the whole interview process that you go through is very much constructed around, okay, what do I need to deliver? And what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? So what do I have to deliver to this organization on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis? And everything is set out in a process. And if you think about it, it filters right through to how our peer reviews are done, it filters down to general managerial conversations. Everything is process orientated. But if you look at the skill sets that are required to actually make a customer feel that they are the most important thing on the planet and where they experience your organization as an incredible encounter that they are having, that's an entirely different set of skill sets. And we as a company have actually gone and we've done very, very deep research into the area of what are the skill sets of the future that are going to enable companies to become customer-centric? What is going to enable that cultural change? 
And we've actually brought a digital anthropologist onto this project, and she's done very deep research, and she's also working on very similar projects with the likes of Adobe and IBM inside their Watson team and stuff, and basically asking that question, what are these skill sets that are needed for the future? And on this screen that you're looking at right now, you can see those key differentiators. The difference between the process thinking that we very much follow in today inside people versus what is needed in the future is two basic categories, if you can break it up into that, which is creativity and critical thinking. And then getting very specific about what those skills are if you break it down. It's the ability to adapt, adapt to change. It's the ability to take what you're thinking inside and visually represent it. Okay, so very much leaning towards like a designer skill set. The ability to teach, so not only to consume information, but to actually be able to mentor and teach people around you. Very, very superior communication skills, collaboration. And then on the critical thinking side, it's the ability to actively listen. So that's not just listen with a view to give your opinion, but to listen, to digest, and actually take that information in and change your response based on it. It's the ability to empathize, so to walk in somebody else's shoes. And then this is a very interesting one, the ability to actually design a question and query environment. So where conversations are not just the pushing of information, but where it's digging up further things that haven't necessarily surfaced yet and then very much ethical conduct as well. And if you look at these 10 skills that are listed on this slide, if you were to be very brutally, brutally honest, very few people across the board inside an organization embrace every single one of these skills. But ultimately, these are the skills that are gonna make or break organizations towards actually becoming customer-centric in their thinking and in their mindset. And so going back to that framework of leadership, the individual as well as the technology, it's this piece where we're really, really going to have to start collaborating inside companies to think about how can we start getting entire teams and entire companies to embrace these skills because when people have these skills, they're going to be able to serve customers better. Claire, so, I want to I emphasize something. Hmm. By the way, th th this is a great slide, but something I want to emphasize, again, the first time I saw this slide, I thought about, wow, this is an amazing skill set that my customer success team needs to have. But you're actually speaking about everybody in the company, right? It's not just yeah. about the customer facing team. This is about, you know, making sure your entire company actually owns or controls some of those skill sets. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. And and Great. that that is the whole thing, you know, is that this is something that needs to be spread across the entire organization. And so this is not, as you say, just something that can be adopted and needs to be infiltrated across the customer success team. It's like executive leadership have to be leading in this area, HR, marketing, sales, every single department. And that's where we really, really have to take a step back as customer success leaders and go, how are we going to work with the rest of the organization to make this happen? So I've got a few very practical <laughs> suggestions, and these are very real things that we are doing on the ground inside our own organization, but also with the teams and the companies that we're working with. So I'm going to move over to the next slide, and I'm going to start um, you know, talking specifically about some of these things. So the very first thing is, We've structured our company and we very much encourage the companies that we work with where we're helping them to build out their customer success functions to start moving away from the traditional team build um, that you currently see in companies towards hives. And this is a very interesting concept. It literally goes back to how bees construct their hives. And the very interesting thing that a lot of people don't know about bees is that every single worker bee has a buddy. And so whenever something goes wrong or whenever something, um, you know, help is needed or anything happens in the hive, that bee, that worker bee will revert to their buddy first in order to make the problem go away by collaborating with this buddy. And so what we're saying to organizations is that if you want to permeate this change and if you want to go and really, really bring about these customer-centric skill sets that we spoke about on this slide, one of the key things that you actually need to start with is the skill set of collaboration. And one of the best ways to do that is to start bringing in a hive mentality. So literally everybody in the company, from the CEO right down to the, you know, the barista who sits and makes coffee for everybody, every single person in the organization should have a, a, a buddy. And you then start building that 
this is a helping culture. This is a culture that's very much focused on moving things forward. One of the key changes that needs to happen in leadership, and this is a whole section that we literally have very, very difficult conversations with executive teams about, is that something that has started happening inside companies very recently in the last few years is that you see people moving towards what I would call like a constructive criticism framework. But the reality is, is that constructive criticism is only so good as when it actually does include honesty. Constructive criticism should never, ever be there if it's devoid of honesty. If somebody's done a really, really bad job, they need to be told that in a constructive way. And unfortunately, what you're starting to see in a lot of organizations is that the honesty about what people actually think about the work that other people are delivering is not being said, but the person's feelings are being put first and constructive criticism is basically coming to the fore. And I think if you really, really want to serve a customer well, you have to start bringing honesty into the conversation. You can't not have honesty in the conversation because customers are not going to lie to you about how they're experiencing your service. And so that same type of honesty needs to reflect back into the company itself. And then what you then can start doing, once you've got those two things in place, so you've got a support structure in the form of a hive, you're starting to have very honest conversations. You can then start becoming very intentional about mentoring. You can start becoming very intentional about self-reflection. So we start getting people to really start journaling and thinking and talking amongst themselves about what, is it, what did I actually do with the customer today? Did I think it went well or did I not think it went well? And then you structured that into reflection, which you reflect back to your customer and have a conversation with your customer about. Omar, what are your thoughts about some of those initiatives? Well, I, I'm really connected to that. For example, you know, honest conversation. I think sometimes it's difficult, but, you know, one of the things we're doing in the company is whenever there's an issue with a customer, and it doesn't matter why it's an issue, we really are trying to have an honest conversation that everybody's involved. We have the customer success manager and the customer success leader yeah. and the salesperson, the marketing. So we bring the right stakeholders from the company and, and the purpose of it is, is to really learn from it. And I think the only way you can learn is being honest. Uh, and it takes some, you know, time and, and some coaching. But uh, once you're being honest about what you think about the performance of other people, what they think about their own performance, because sometimes it's also difficult to, you know, to uh, actually testify about my own performance. This is where honest conversation actually excel and, and bring the right information. Mm, mm. And I think what would be really good right now, Christine, if you can take that last poll in, that would be great to see what the audience think of that last poll. We actually want to ask a question across the board, which is, Christine, can we bring that poll up? Really like to hear what the audience has to say about this, is whether you guys actually have a customer advisory board in place, because that's a, it's a key, key skill and a key element that needs to be inside a company. And I, I basically want to wrap up the webinar before we open it up to Q&A to everybody is, is whether this is in place inside organizations. I'd love to just see what some of the results are because it ties very much back to what Omar has also just been saying. Claire, okay. while people are still submitting their answers, can you explain what a customer advisory board is? Yes, I was planning to do that. So, guys, coming back to one of the key points that, that we need to walk away from this webinar with is that ultimately the way to measure customer centricity is the quality of the experience. And the quality of anything is a really, really difficult thing to measure. And that's why I've asked this question about the customer advisory board because ultimately if we are talking about putting in the most amazing customer process and really, really bringing the customer to the fore. And that's, you know, having our executive leadership buying into it, that's having, you know, processes and the most amazing technology in place to enable and automate that way possible. But at the end of the day, if our customers' voices are not part of that, it's, it's going to be a useless and futile exercise. We actually need to be having those honest conversations with our clients and going, where are we really crappy at serving you, but where are we also really good? You know, what does our customer experience feel like to you? 
And I spoke about this particularly at the Customer Success Summit as well. It's, it's a very simple thing. If you think about a date or an encounter with your child or those really, really amazing moments that stand out in your life, it's the experience inside that moment. It's the experience of how your significant partner makes you feel. That, that is what the quality is. And it's a very hard thing to measure quantitatively in, like, for example, an NPS score or something like that. And so where a customer advisory board comes in and what exactly it is, is it's exactly like a board, okay? So like you have a board for a company, but it consists of customers. And so it, it basically consists of customers that reflect all the different tiers of customers that you have. So it would be a representative from your enterprise clients. It would be a representative from your small to medium clients. And then it would be a representative of your lowest, lowest, lowest value clients, but who still make up a really important part of your business. And it's an actual board, so it's run like a board meeting, but it's run with a specific outcome of finding out what your customers want to see more of, want to see less of, what's going well in the organization. And so it's basically giving them a seat at the table to become a really, really active part of the business. And that information is then fed back into marketing, is fed back into HR, is fed back into all parts of the organization. And so if you're looking at that customer-centric skill set, yes, very similar to a customer council. I can see somebody's, um, Bettis has just left a comment there, similar to a customer council, exactly that. And if you look at these initiatives that we're speaking about that happens inside companies that brings about this customer-centric culture, these are the things that will ultimately build towards the quality of that experience, where your customer will go away and say, you know, I can't quite put a number to this, but the quality is amazing. Like the way I feel when I experience your organization is incredible. And that's ultimately what you're looking for. So, Christine, are we ready to open up to Q&A fully across the... Yeah, let's go ahead and jump into Q&A. I can actually see a question has come in there already from Brittany, focus groups essentially. Brittany, no, they, customer advisory boards are actually distinctly different from focus groups. So what you're trying to achieve with a focus group is you're trying to achieve a very specific result for a very specific service or offering. Very seldom are focus groups generic for the business. Because focus groups are actually very expensive to run, and like there's a lot of logistics around them in terms of actually getting people to dedicate their time and everything like that. And so, what focus groups are generally used for is to test the viability or, you know, the the problems around a project product launching or something like that. Whereas the purpose of a customer advisory board is long term buy in from a customer. So. It's a genuine long-term involvement, and it's getting the customers to understand that there's a representative representing them inside the company that's actually hearing them and taking those concerns and, and complaints and, and ideas and suggestions to the company, and that that's filtering down into the systems and the processes and the thinking of the company. Thanks, Claire. So one question um, came in earlier, and I think you spoke to it a little bit, but I'd like Omer to um, weigh in. Um, Omer, uh, one participant wanted to know, how can we implement customer success in a service-oriented IT firm? Do you want to speak to that and some of the um, experience we've seen with Tatango customers? Yeah, actually we have uh, a few Tatango customers that are service IT uh, companies. And again, it's about the customer. It doesn't really matter exactly what is the service or product that you provide, but as long as you have you know, the right data and you know what is the service that they're consuming, uh, whether they're happy or not, whether they open support tickets, when is the last time people speak to them, there are a lot of signals around even a service management uh, solution or, or company like that that we can collect and gather. I think it starts with you know, the KPIs. What do you want to improve? Or what could you do on actually providing the right data and then implement the custom success solution? Um, so that's my you know, very high level uh, answer. We can drill down into more of that if, if we speak later on. Uh, but definitely, uh, you should be implementing a customer success culture in uh, an organization within a services company as well. Great, thanks. Um, and a question for both of you, uh, and Claire, maybe you want to take it first. So, 
you know, for customer centricity and a customer first culture, you um, we've talked a lot about how the executive team needs to be on board, um, and the entire organization needs to be a part of that culture. Can you summarize some of those key takeaways that um, and action items that the audience should be um, taking away from this webinar? Sure. So, John, I can also see there from your question, um, you know, you specifically said, you know, what are the actual action items that, that you can take back to your team? If, if you look at the different levels, I'm going to striate the, the organization across three different levels. So you've got your executive level, you've got your middle tier level, and then you've got your, what I would call your worker level, so your people at the coalface actually doing the work. Every single one of those layers inside the organization have got different needs. And so in order to actually pitch this in a way to them that they buy into it, you need to strike it according to that as well. So if you're looking at it from a leadership perspective, at the end of the day, they have to drive the metrics in the company. So everything for them is, okay, if I need to adopt a customer-centric thinking, how does that actually increase my profit margin? How does that increase my revenue? Those are the type of things. How does it increase my shareholder wealth? And so you actually need to sit down and do the maths behind it. You need to sit down and ask yourself, if I invest in a team of five customer success people and implement a tool like Tatango, this is going to be the cost, but how am I going to actually prove that there is an increase in revenue because of it? And so that's what you're going to be doing, and that's the conversation that you're going to be having at executive level. When you have that conversation at middle management level, it's entirely different because the middle tier of the organization are carrying a very, very big operational burden. And so for them, it's not so much they are interested in the ROI because they have to report up to that. But at the end of the day, what the biggest pain for them and what you have to address head on for them is, what is this actually going to do to ops? Is this going to be an operational burden on top of everything else that I have to do? So immediately thinking of, if I actually have to train people in an entirely new skill set, what is, what is the actual reality of that? And how am I going to see the ROI on that? And then if you're looking at the people on the ground who are actually doing the work at the coal phase, for them, it's very much a career move. It's very much how does adopting this thinking improve my career, improve my ability to progress up in the organization. And so when you're planning the action items, you need to think about in your organization at which one of those levels you're going to start, what is the ROI for them, and how you are then going to pitch it. And like wrapping that up with actual math is always a very, very good idea. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. And Omar, did you want to add to that? Uh, I think it's about, it's about getting – I'm sorry? I was restating the question. Key takeaways, action items. So, so I think it's about, you know, leadership. Uh, it's about getting the buy-in. I saw some question about what happens if people do not care. We need to, ma to make sure they care or not be in that company with those employees. Uh, it's sometimes difficult, and it takes a lot of effort. For example, one of the things I would try – is bring them in front of a customer or bring customer in front of them, share case study, share success story, share failure story. Try to make sure that they understand how important is this, and it starts with leadership. Great. I just, um, there's a question that's come in there in terms, um, I just want to see it here. Providing a high touch, highly personalized experience is really challenging with a number of accounts. How many accounts per customer do you suggest each customer success manager should have? And that's a question from Carla. Carla, there isn't a generic answer that you can give to that. So literally, it doesn't matter what industry you're looking at. It's actually the wrong question to be asking. And this is why it's the wrong question to be asking is you cannot determine that number until you've actually determined what the process and the offering is that you need to take your customers through in order to provide the highest value to them. And that literally differs for every single product and for every single company. And this is where a lot of customer success people make a mistake, is that they don't really, really deep dive into 
what do I have to do to get my customer to value as quickly as possible to create that incredible experience for them? If you can break that down into an actual journey that you want your customer to walk, and you can then assign and you can go, okay, this is going to take me X amount of hours, which means I need X amount of people. You are then able to do the math behind that. And that's a critical, critical actual piece of work that you have to do in order to get to the bottom of that math. And, and I want to add, the, add to that because there is a better way to provide a higher touch when you have a lot of customers. And it's about automation. If you have data mm-hmm. and you have systems in place that can actually replicate what a customer success person is doing using automatic tools like Tutango and Zoe, for example, this is where you can, again, define the engagement model that Claire spoke about, but make sure it's scalable and make sure you're using technology and not just people. That's the way to provide a higher touch, even if you have a higher number of accounts. I think we're getting near the top of the hour. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, Omer, for your time today as well. Thank Thank you very much. Good. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.